You are now tuned in to the Pitney Podcast. Tonight, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Isla and Ogun. Maybe they'll say something to the family before we get started. Hello, everybody. Much respect, family. Glad to be here. Tonight's program is sponsored by our good friends, Jeff and Kim of Turo and Just Vegan. Turo is a rental car app that takes a lot of the hassle away from your trip so you can focus on what really matters. Rent a car. <laughs> Yikes. Rent a car from Jeff and Kim, and they have a variety of rides that you can choose from. Um, they're competitively priced, they're, they service the Houston airport and metro area, and they have a stellar five star review. So you won't be disappointed. So check them out. Um, We'll post their link in the jumbo as well as just vegan. It's a brand that's near and dear to me. Uh, Vegan cookies that don't taste like paper and won't make you fat as long as you don't overboard or abuse them. That is just vegan has an assorted assortment of baked goods that are freshly made to order. But our fan favorite has been the tuxedo chocolate butter biscuits. So check us out today. The order form will be posted in the jumbo. So, without further ado, tonight we have a special guest in the building. Y'all know her as Sister Ali, but I was introduced to her as a master teacher. Uh, She's featured in Hidden Colors 1, 3, and 5. Miss Ali has been giving dysfunctional systems the business since before it was cool to do so. And look, if we're being honest, it's still not cool to do so, but... We're course correcting over here on the Pickney Podcast, so you got to bear with us. This is real-time work that we're doing. Um, y'all remember our first broadcast, What's So Wrong With Being a Pickney? You know, mainstream media and society wants us thinking that there's something wrong with wanting a man to choose you. So anyway, we're still making uncomfortable situations more comfortable. Anyway, Master Teacher Ali is an author, a Black family activist, and advocate. She's also a historian, and she's so much more, y'all. Her books, I feel like they were written before their time because they made people uncomfortable. And y'all know how I feel about uncomfortable conversations. That's definitely something we try to do here often on the Pick Me podcast. But this teacher did the best thing any educator could do, which is lead by example. She's a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and she can attest to the role of the Black woman and how harmonious our music is when we're all playing the part we were designed to play. I know there's a lot of examples of what not to do, so when opportunities to get gamed up in real time by a respected feminine elder is presented, we will take full advantage of those opportunities. So without further ado, peace, Sister Ali. Welcome to the Pick Me Podcast. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I need to tape that and just play it over and over beside <laughs> my bed. <laughs> so I can't remember really who I am and what it is I'm trying to do. But uh, you're absolutely right in the sense that, you know, I've been out here 38 years, so I know a lot of history. I don't have to read and study a lot of things. I was there, I saw it, or I was involved, or I knew someone involved in different movements and different behaviors and things. And uh, I was able to, uh, I am able to compare the generations and the generation of changes. And I say all the time, you know, change doesn't always mean better. It just means different. So things are different now. And so I'm able to look at how parenting and relationships and raising children has all been evolved into what we have today. And so I think that that's one of the benefits that I have been blessed to be a witness to so that I can come and share that information with you young people today to give you more options. I don't want you all to keep choosing between the cell phone and a job. I want you to have other information that you can use to determine what your goals in life are going to be, what you're going to try to do, and us as women, of course, how to have a man how to work with what we have and have to try to make it better. Absolutely. Much respect to you and thank you. And really, thank you for taking the time out tonight to come chat with us. Uh, your time is money, so we appreciate you being here. Um, 
this podcast, like I kind of said earlier, is about uncomfortable conversations. And in 2022, now going on 2023, so like you said, some 30 plus years after The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman, I used to be angry because I thought everybody knew better, but I'm afraid I've come to the conclusion that the Black community, well, at least some of us in the Black community, are stuck on stupid. And (laughs) what I mean by that is, I mean... Yeah, we're dealing with racism, white supremacy. I can't take that away from what we're dealing with. But Sister Ali, isn't some stuff just natural and unnatural? Well, uh, absolutely. I think we're looking at uh, our younger children growing up with unnatural ideas and ideas that are not going to make success for them. Uh, As an example, right now, from 2019, from the studies, you know, that they do out there, uh, we spend about $25,000 or $26,000 a year on each student. That's starting in the kindergarten all the way up until they graduate out of high school or to the 12th grade, you know, whatever they have in those communities. We spend $26,000 a year on them. That's essentially, compared to other countries, a low amount in the sense that uh, the studies have not been conducive to producing the kind of black people who we used to produce without the modern public school system education. We had better people. They learned more when we were teaching in a one-room schoolhouse or in the basement and places like that, you know, and that's saying to look at. But even up to uh, 19, say, 59, 60, uh, we were able to teach our children information that they could benefit from and that they could see that they would benefit from it. Well, we spent $82,000 a year on every prisoner. Hmm. So we are investing more in the prison system of trying to deal with the outcome instead of putting the money in the income to see if we can make something better, something different. Uh, We have been quarreling with white people for over 50 years about uh, school curriculum and what should be taught and what the lies are and what the truth is and all of that. When, you know, we've been also talking for years that we need our own schools. And that just has become just a cliche uh, comment, just like, we got to all come together. You know, that's not going to happen like that either. And so all of this of uh, us not creating our own educational institutions we haven't really had a great black leader since the 50s and 60s because we have not had our own private schools education. When I say private school, I don't mean institution. I mean a school where there were just black people and black teachers. Mm-hmm. Jesse Jackson, Sharpton, uh, all of the people that we see out here, you know, all of them, the so-called leaders that we have, even Dr. King, all of them, it came out of the black womb of a black only school where they were able to study, to speak freely about what they were feeling and going through and come up with solutions among ourselves. But since the integration that we thought was some kind of magic pill that was going to turn out better mothers and fathers and children and teachers and everything, we have not had any, any kind of success in that way. We produced Barack Obama, but he it was not for us. He is not for us. And so his, his uh, uh, was uh, inspirational. His position as president was inspirational, but it was not transformational. It didn't transform any of us into anything. In fact, things got worse, and they're continuing to be that way. And so, you know, all of those things contribute to how we get along with each other. That's where I'm bringing that around to. All of those activities and all of those situations and incidents and setbacks, all of those things contribute to who we are today. That's that's the way each generation does. That's real talk, Miss Ali. And you, you brought a really good point with how much society invests in the youth. And yeah. if we just took a little bit of that and invested in ourselves, then, you know, we might be doing better than what they're feeding us. Um, 
I 1000% agree with the private school education of a black school because your children are comfortable being around people that look like them. They don't have to worry yeah. about, you know, stranger well, danger. Say, you know, now you got the thought police. You mm-hmm. did have the speech police, you know. Uh, we believe in, in the Constitution, we believe in the freedom of speech. White people believe in the right to keep and carry guns. Mm-hmm. Say, so we, we're looking, we think freedom is being able to say what you want and wear what you want and things like that. When that's essentially not freedom. Freedom is independence. And we have not uh, figured out how to do that. Now, everybody's not going to go into business. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, just like racism, ideas of independence are just ideas. You don't have to go around having a meeting about it and talking to people. You don't have to join nothing. It's not required. It's just something that you have in your own mind and head, and it governs your behavior. What you do, what you believe in, what you spend your money on, and things like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is the new black media that taught me that, you know, you want to know what somebody thinks is important. You look at their bank account. You look in their wallet and see where they're spending. (laughs) So that's real. (laughs) Yeah, that's real. That's just real. You know, you see, you know, we used to have that old saying, put your money where your mouth is. Right. And and talk still is cheap, but we got people out here, each generation. And this is what's sad about it. Each generation, like, starts all over. You know, they make up an organization. They come up with a slogan. And, you know, I mean, look at how big things like uh, the Black Lives Matter and all of that was. You don't hear anybody mention that anymore. Right. They're not doing anything to serve our people in that way. And so we have to, like, flash in the pan ideas. And we do that. And we carry skittles, and we march, and we protest, because it doesn't require real change. That's just a physical activity. And that also impacts upon our relationships. We want sex to solve all of our problems of getting along, and it doesn't. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Look, you made me think about something. The animal kingdom, you know, to see every animal on God's green earth know their role and how they're supposed to act and then we're supposed to be the keepers of all of that but you've got people doing the same thing over and over on purpose and on accident and you know they're trying to figure out what went wrong you know they're they're pulling from playbooks where there's already a loss and as i said we just see each generation just keeps starting all over like they just found out about racism, they just found out that we need our own schools. I mean, it's just ridiculous. We're just going around, you know, in a circle. And uh, it's a lot of things happening that we're just not aware of. You know, every 29 seconds, the earth shakes. We're not aware of it. That don't mean it's not happening. But we can't tell it unless somebody teaches us about it. And then, you know, we can be aware of it. But if every time somebody try to teach us something, we reject that truth because they will require us to make some kind of change of betterment for ourselves or our family or our community, then this is why we can't get anywhere with that. It stays a dialogue because it's easier to tell about something than it is to show it. So we could talk all day long about, yeah, we needed this, we needed that. Okay, so what we do? So then who's going to do the work? When we going to do that? We have a few examples of the different ideas that we have mulled over for the past 50 years. We have some examples of those things. You know, every, in a few states, you got certain special schools for boys. You got more black men returning to teaching to work with our boys. Um, some places are putting shop back into the schools because that's something else that misshaped our men coming out of school. And that's been, as I said, I always use 50 years because that's something you all can identify with more. I can really use, you know, I can use more years than that, but I use something (laughs) that you all can have a frame of reference for. And uh, that is that back in the day, and we're talking about now in the 50s and 60s, the schools, especially in the urban areas, had shop. And that was refrigeration repair. There was air conditioning. That was carpentry, plumbing, automobile repair. There was all of those kind of things that prepared our men that when they got out of school, they had an idea and some qualifications to go somewhere and get a job. 
whether they worked for the enemy or whoever it was, they had some skills. They could stand up straight and be proud of the fact that they knew how to do something. You can't find a brother now, even sometime in his 30s, that can know how to change a tire. Mm. You can't get them to help with moving. I pass by places all the time, and there's two or three sisters out there moving furniture. Mm. See? They can't put the toilet seat on. They can't you know, get the mirror up on the wall. I mean, there's just so many things now that our men are just not qualified to do because they were not trained to do those things. And they have tried to replace that with W.E.B. Du Bois' idea. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's uh, if you get the proper education, you will automatically be able to move up in society and you'll be able to do things. And that's not the way it works. Booker T. Washington had a better idea when he had the people at his school where he taught them how to do carpentry, how to do farming, how to repair equipment, how to cook, how to sew, and do all of those things that would give them some skills. Knowledge builds confidence if it's something that you do physically. And I get that, okay? If you know how to do something, it builds confidence. If you just know something, you know, you got a good rap and you can go out and talk about things, but if you don't have anything to point at and say, see, here it is right here, this is it, this is what I'm talking about, I did this, or someone else did this, then you haven't really made any progress. And that's where our youth are now. We have allowed our children to get tricked with the cell phones. The cell phones are just as addictive as nicotine, alcohol, and drugs. And this is why so many of our children have gotten so angry. This is of all nationalities. If their parents try to punish them by taking their phone, they've killed their parents in many times. They've attacked them physically. They've shot them. They've done a lot of things because they can't handle being away from the cell phone. And that's most of our adults, too. People talk about taking a break from the phone. What kind of nonsense is this? <laughs> you understand? I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get offline. Oh, I'm not going to deal with my phone. I'm not going to read it and everything. It's absurd. And and that's not even to speak of the relationships that cell phones have broken up. Hmm. See, that's... There's a lot of damage that they've done in there with a lot of different pictures and uh, phone calls and things. Yeah, that's the main thing everybody wants to do now with a man or a woman to check their phone. That's not our life. It's not our idea. But we're doing it, and we're playing with them all day. Go to the airport or somewhere and go to where the people are waiting on the, on the flight to come in and just look around. Somebody could run through that naked. They would never know because everybody is stuck in their face and their phone. And, I, and as I said, it's just an addiction. And they've convinced us it's the only market that they say they've ever had where they had a 100%, uh, they didn't consider it. They just didn't, it was just nobody in that industry at that time thought anybody would want a cell phone. Remember, they started out with little beepers and stuff. They didn't think anybody would want a cell phone but businessmen. And now you got children two and three years old got a cell phone. Everybody got a cell phone. Everybody. That's that's Everybody. Real. And I have a little a grandson here. He's 20 months old, 21, or he's 22 now, months old. You ought to see him operate there. He play games on there. He got a tablet. He got all of that. He ain't even two. Mm. <laughs> and so we're slowing it up. You know, we just, of course, we monitor his education. We think that's how he has. But I'm saying, this is how the children are now. They can be dumb as hell, but if you hand them a cell phone, they can operate it and manipulate it and do different things on there. Now, if anybody thinks that that's not on purpose, it's intentional. It has captured our attention. It has captured all of our ideas and goals and conversations. What happened online? Go to Instagram, sit up and watch that two or three hours. And so, you know, we, we have a, a, in the Facebook, uh, that's even worse for us. So I'm just saying, these things from other people who are not on our side have been offered to us. And since we don't have anything to compete with some of their ideas of entertainment, then we, uh, we go for it and we buy it. And, and they're very expensive. 
you, you probably got more phone companies than you got utility companies in America. Mm. Because this is what we're doing. And as I said, the damage it has done to relationships is incalculable. We can't even, you know, uh, compute that. Of yes. how much damage those things have caused with us getting along with each other. People have been killed over things in the cell phone. They've broken up. Cars have been destroyed. All kind of stuff. But something that, that uh, we don't even manufacture. Well, we don't manufacture anything. We don't even manufacture drugs. We don't manufacture uh, hardly anything. And we can't get agreement about the cell phones with our children because they've made us think it was a safety thing only and uh, that uh, you have to have it. And uh, that's where we are on that. I but it, it, starts fights in, it starts fights in our homes. I, I think it's a communication thing, right? Because, you know, back in the day, you used to, you used to could hang up on somebody, you know, they could hear the click in the dial tone or <laughs> you, <laughs> you could, yeah, you're right. you would have to call and, you know, ask to speak to someone, you know, there wasn't like a direct connection to the person you were trying to speak to. So different barriers were there and it made us use our critical thinking skills. We had to be clever sometimes, you know, if you weren't supposed to be on the phone when you was on the phone, you know, and you had to speak to somebody's parent, but now, yeah, now I'll call you back. Right, right. Yeah, you, you know, like you have, like, listen. I gotta go. I gotta go wash the dishes. You know. Oh, I gotta go and catch my bus. Well, see now you just stick the phone on the side of your head. You do all of that with the phone with you. Exactly. Exactly. So we're you, you attached never have to, to it. break that contact with whatever it is. We've never talked to each other that much. We're not into each other that way. Women are men, you know, but now everybody is stuck on that. They can't do anything else, and they run back to it, and they carry it in their hand. The women, a lot of the young girls, they don't even carry a purse no more, but they carry a phone. That's right. And our pockets aren't even big enough for these phones if we're being None honest. of that, right. Because <laughs> they're getting bigger and bigger, too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they started out big, then they got small, and then they get big again. That's okay? right. They like books and all kind of stuff. But anyway, those are just some, that's just some of the backstory that got us to where we are today and not getting along. For sure. Um, my man tells me all the time that men and women assess threats differently. And I, yeah, I believe yeah. that because I used to be a person who would go grocery shopping at nighttime. I, I don't do that anymore because it's not safe, but it wasn't something right. I thought about until it was, uh, you know, until it was addressed. Um, mm -hmm. do you think that if we are looking at things differently like that, that maybe we communicate differently as well? Men have a way of communicating. Oh things. yeah. We, uh, we, uh, constantly who can fight for our men. Okay. Now we're constantly doing that unconsciously of what these things mean. Uh, they look at things differently. Uh, they hear it differently. Yeah, uh, this is just a terrible example, and then I'll give you another one. <laughs> but it's like women will come home, and uh, they'll find out something about their man, maybe, you know, their boyfriend or something. And they'll say, you know, you brought her in my house, in our home, and you had sex with her in our bed. Well, plus this, there's, that's a, like I say, this is a drastic point, but that's not the holy grail to no man. That ain't nothing but a bed. It could be a mattress, it could be a, a, a tent, it could be anything. It don't have that value to him. But to us, the I, I mean, that's such a terrible insult. In the same bed, when it's nothing but a bed. It's just a mattress or something. We didn't make it anyway. But that's just an example of how we tend to hear things differently. We go out. We already have a man. And many times we go out dressed in the most lewd or tight or revealing clothes that we can find. Now, we're booking a fight for him because if some other man come up and say something rude or touch us or do anything that's insulting, then our man has got to go defend you and stand up for that. He got to check that guy that did that to you. Mm-hmm. And so the men are not out there just assessing 
other women, they're assessing the dude that they with, so they got to determine, you know, if I can take her, if I can take him. That's very dangerous. And I tell my grandsons about it all the time. To be careful of that, look at what those women have on. I say, you're all handsome and intelligent young men, and they want to be with you, so just tell them to put, they have to change clothes or put on something else. That's real and so we, we, Yeah, we, we, I mean, that's just the reality of it, and they have to know how to do that to protect themselves. The second thing I tell them is to uh, make sure that they protect their own f- uh, fertility. You're not counting on a woman to take birth control pills. You do something to take care of yourself. Because mm-hmm. we can't believe each other. And when we as women are trying to be with a man, and if all else fails, especially if he starts getting something going good financially, if all else fails, we'll get pregnant. Because we think that if we get pregnant, then that'll attach us to um, get hold on to the man. Make him still be in our life. You know, we like the little children. We want attention, negative or positive. It don't matter as long as it's attention. So we have to be careful of those kind of things. And we have to try to teach our girls something different. Absolutely. Um, Speaking of, because you you talked about your grandsons, and I think that this is a good turning point. Um, I don't know if you've heard the argument, well, I'll do that or I'll do these things for him once he does this for me. And then you've got women who aren't fulfilling their role because they haven't gotten a ring yet or they're not the wife yet. And, oh. Oh, That's absurd. Historically, just historically, if you want somebody to do something, you first do it yourself. That's the leading by example. I remember that uh, when my son got to be a grown man, you know, uh, and I'm just using these different examples. These are not the rules, so don't say I'm just, I don't want anybody to be calling her and talking about, well, she just talking about her family. No, I'm just giving examples of what Negroes do. Okay. That's very true. Tra- yeah, these are traditional behaviors. And so uh, I wanted to try that out after I had been taught that. And so I uh, would talk to him. And when he was younger, of course, I already said, you know, you know how you say to a child, I love you. Uh, whoever it is, you say, oh, I love you, love you much, or whatever. Well, he had kind of grown away from that. He was out in the world, had his own business and family, doing everything. And he would just say, you know, okay, mama, all right, we'll talk to you later, whatever. And so I started saying to him, because I recognized I wasn't saying it either. And I started saying to him, and I love you, and I love you very much, or something like that. And eventually, he started saying, mama, I love you. I love you, mama. No matter whatever we hung up. And so I say, you know, that really does work. So a lot of things that we complain about in our men is because we're not setting the example. We're withholding our hand, thinking that if we withhold our hand long enough, then that he'll do something different or it will occur to him or he'll do that for me so that then that way maybe I'll do it for him. None of that works. That's all nonsense and that's not how to have a relationship. For years, I used to tell the sisters, listen, everybody, you know, that I'll get around in every conference, no matter where it was, all the women looking for a man, all the men looking for a woman. But if I put all of them people in the same room together, they don't even, they just almost ignore each other. They <laughs> can't get along. They can't speak. You know, you know, what's those things you do at work where you go around and people give each other their business cards? They will hardly even do that. The men come to the men and the women come to the women. <laughs> and uh, I just look at, I, I, it's like I said, you know, being out here almost 40 years, you just see these things like, well, what is going on now? And that's the uh, voice that I'm speaking from. Uh, even down to sex. Look at how we have corrupted that. Now, everything, every day on the internet, on the Instagrams and Facebooks and all of this stuff, it's just turned almost totally sexual. And the rest is comedy. It's, 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 white people got ads on that, so it holds up, okay? But the rest of us is just a bunch of nonsense. And so uh, I never thought I would see the day where adult black women, not just girls, would get online, pull their pants down, and shake their naked behind to the world. Mm. Now, that is a new low. Now, as we know, 
this uh, uh, artificial intelligence, these computers, they go all over the world. And so we tend to travel to other foreign countries and get treated rude sometimes. Or people staring at us like we're some kind of animal. Because that is the image that they have of the black woman in America. Mm. So these sisters out here doing this, they're not just bringing their sex down, they're bringing all of us down. And it's a terrible thing. Our little girls are trying to do it. But these are adult women who are so desperate that they believe that that's the only way to get attention from a man. You are so right. Our public image is in the crapper. And it's, again, I, I know that we're dealing with racism and white supremacy. So to the audience, y'all know how yeah, I feel. We can't blame that the same way no more. We, right. There is there is some personal accountability that needs to happen. And right. that kind of brings me to this other point I wanted to talk to you about was the passport bros. And not necessarily about the men per se, but the audacity of these other women. Because... I mean, I wholeheartedly believe that if Jamal is a lame in Toledo, he's going to be a lame in Brazil. But you've got these men who think that because they're not getting what they need from us, that they can go somewhere else around the world and get it from them. And the women in these areas are very loud about being chosen. And I think about, again, you know, Jamal is a lame, you know, he probably is still lame, but the numbers they're already stacked against us. It's like two to one, you know, two women to one man. So if we're taking men out the situation, then you've got three to one and four to one. And while I think that we are seeing that in real time, because you've got, you know, uh, Stanley has five different baby mothers. So it's already five to one. It's way more than five these days. But I look at that situation, I kind of compare it to integration. Hmm. See, when you integrate with another nationality, especially from another place or whatever, another class even, uh, you can become anybody you want to be. You can present yourself as whoever you can make up in your mind to be. And then you can just act that out and pretend to be that person for as long as you want to. Well, that's the way it works with the brothers that's seeking these other women. They can go and introduce themselves to them as anybody they want to. Now, that, they not meeting the same man we meet. We know that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they meet somebody else, okay? But uh, the other thing is, is our refusal to accept the actual fact that certain behaviors work better than others. Now, the certain behaviors that those women have is that they're very submissive. They're not real aggressive. They're cooperative. They will cook. They will smile. They will do a lot of things that because of external circumstances, we say, we won't do. We just ain't going to do it because of how he act. Well, they have been trained and reared in another country, in another culture. So they're not making up something to do for our men. This is what they've been trained, and this is how the many of the women where they live, the majority of them, this is how they behave. They're trained from little girls how to be a wife and mother and how to satisfy and please a man. We're raised up in situations mostly where the women hate the men and turn us against our fathers because their relationship failed. Mm. Most of what most of us know about our fathers was told to us by our mothers who are no longer with that man. And you know how we feel then. <laughs> we passed that on. Okay. Hey, you, y'all know what we say then. We passed that on. That stuff. And uh, so our men are seeking peace. Now, we're not talking all of them because they're damaged now. Psychologically, their behavior. It's just a lot of things now, you know. And so we, we're not able to go along with just some of the foolishness that they present us with because we think we know more. We know better and all of that. But we look at uh, our situation and we're angry with our man. And they sick of us. And what that produces is that man is outside looking for peace of mind. Mm. In our situation, he's outside of the country looking for peace of mind. And if he finds it, 
he believes that it'll be there eternally, and he will choose to go and just have some of that sometime. He may not can afford to stay all year, but he can go sometime. <laughs> At least he knows it does exist that a woman can treat him the way he wants to be treated. Mm, that's that's a damn shame. Yeah, that's deep. <laughs> that's real deep, but that's what we do. It is, and you you brought a point home that the women in these other areas are reared like this not that they're you know i don't i've I've seen i've seen a lot of videos where they're talking a lot of stuff a lot of crap to us black women about how well look at your man choosing up on me and all that all the stuff that you just said so i don't think it's an authentic want to be with our man as much as they know that they have a role and you know they need to be with a man oh no they do want to be with him we got the best man we got the finest man on the earth oh no they want to be with him because they big and fine and that that also angers us because so many women are attracted to them oh no 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 they want to be with them Mm. quick as they can (laughs) okay now but you could take one of those women's mother bring her to america and have her have a baby and raise them up in america and they'll be just like all the rest of us you understand the Mm. cultures are different the environment is different the environment is stronger than your nature in america because is... our man have used to have, uh, not a docile, but our man used to have a more calm nature. Yeah. Now, of course, this sounds like a generalization, because it is. But many of our men who were up and uh, upstanding, when I say upstanding, I mean men, you know, who wasn't in jail, had a child, a car, something like that. You know, that's what we used to judge them by. And, of course, how they treated us. Uh, those, those are, uh, they were able to uh, function differently and they had their pick of the litter because they hadn't got corrupted by the enemy and us and I always remind us we have to take our part of the now that's, uh, again like I said I don't mean all 40 million but, but we have to take our part of the responsibility for their condition because we are the mother we brag about we do the mother and the father in some cases. We are the mother. We have the child the most. We touch them first. We rear them. So we have some accountability in that. We can't say that our child, our children are fools and illiterate because they didn't have a father. Because education still exists. It wasn't nothing that just the father had. His influence, of course, was great. But we, we, we managed to just get along with our men laying down. We don't get along with them if we don't want to stand up. Because they don't say the things or do the things that we want them to do. But uh, the the biggest time we're cooperative is in the bed. Once we all stand up, things change. They do. So what I wanted to mention, uh, uh, excuse me, what I wanted to mention though about the sexual thing, and I don't usually discuss anything like that because it's just, to me improper and it's not necessary but this is necessary because what I was leading to when I was talking about the sisters on that with they make it up to shake into the world I was saying that we have pushed so much sex on our men we have uh, in the way we dress you know all the vulgar hip thrusts and twists and everything that we do dancing uh, we have just become so bold in so many things many of us that and between the porn movies, more black women than porn movies in America than any other country, the porn movies, all of these different things that we are doing sexually to attract the attention of a man has backfired because it has made him, that's the only thing he's interested in with us. And what has ended up is that the difference between animals mating and humans mating is that Animals mate from the rear and humans mate face to face. <laughs> well, we are now all just mating back to back, from the back. That's how our men are having sex with us. They're not even, they this is what's all over. This is a trend. So there are trends in everything, including sex, food, cars, clothes. There's trends in everything. So the trend in sex now that's out there is that the men are behind the women, beating their behinds, or doing different choking them, spitting in their face, or slapping them. This is what all they call in sex, man. I've talked to them, so I know this is true. And uh, while they doing all of that, the women are completely disengaged because they face it down in a pillow or something. You know, that connection is not there. 
we made them like animals, not savages. And that's worrying me. That disturbs me also in that sense. I guess my word, but it disturbs me because that's furthering our connection, disconnection from each other. Absolutely. That's, that's the communication yeah, that, that, thing that, right no there. Again. There's no love making in that. It's not. Uh, how we communicate physically, it, it's another method of communication. So it, definitely on the spot with <laughs> if y'all aren't even yeah, looking at but, each other. But I mean, when I recognize that, I say, wait a minute, what's happening here? You know what? What are y'all doing? So they have turned something that they have in the system that they have turned something you know, our music say was, uh, oh, I want to love you. Oh, baby, please come back. You know, oh, I miss you. Oh, I can't wait to see you. Our music was more of love. Mm-hmm. And the music that has been out for the past 25 years, definitely, has been one of hate. The men say they're going to beat it up. They slap each other and choke each other. That's not love. All the music is about, I hate that B, that B ain't no good, and all this, all of that. Yeah, so the connection is, is breaking more and more. So we are, have grown tired of each other, in a sense. And that's another reason that the men are just don't feel like it. They're just trying to go elsewhere to find somebody that they can get along with, somebody who can hear him, somebody who don't say no to every idea, uh, somebody who will uh, uh, give him the proper food so he can live a long time. See, food is a powerful weapon. Mm -hmm. And what we feed our men and ourselves and children determines how well we're going to be, how long we're going to live, and the condition of that life. So food is important. Historically, women have been in charge of nutrition. Well, now Burger King and Wendy's and and Kentucky Fried, they in charge of nutrition. Because we are working as women. We have to work, most of us. And we are at a distance. And the further away from home a woman works, the more the family suffers. Absolutely. That's... (laughs) <laughs> That's... I know I'm pouring a lot on y'all I'm pouring a lot but uh, you gotta hear the stuff you gotta know it and you gotta listen so you can understand so it can help better your own life absolutely and for the people in the room we appreciate you being here with us on the pick me podcast this space is being recorded for the channel so if you didn't catch the entire conversation you can have an opportunity to catch the playback but um uncomfortable conversations. Miss Ali, I I just feel like the best way to get people moving is, well, they've already decided that they were comfortable. You know, they're sleeping in the bed, you know, they're warm and snuggly, but you're trying to tell them the house is on fire. And instead of them getting out the bed, you know, they roll over. So you got to like knock them out and drag them out. You know? No, it's not going to work that way, darling. Uh, Blindness is a real condition. We all understand the concept of blindness because it's like that we put our keys or our purse or something somewhere and we come in our room and look for it and since we can't find it we leave and go look somewhere else and then we come back a second time to look for it and there it is hmm. well there's no magic it was there all along <laughs> but we couldn't see it so blindness is a real condition and that's what the enemy has done he has put so much foolishness out here that it has clouded the vision of our people to the point where we are blind. It's there what our issues are and the solutions. But we can't see them no more. It's too complicated. It Can, takes too much energy. They definitely have the market cornered with the confusion. And it makes me think about names, like what we call each other. Because we live in an age where society is trying to tell us it's offensive if we don't accept Bruce as Kate. Or even that you have to be a birthing person. Like, what is, what is that? I, I'm so confused well, about... Well, you know, I've looked at that for many years. And I remember, you know, when the things were different and people's attitudes were different. But uh, we're living in a country with bad food, bad water, bad ideas. Uh, a 
And that has equaled us to live in the country of self-hypnosis. And so you could really yourself, just as an example, literally wake up in the morning and say, I'm a goat. And walk <laughs> around and, ah, <laughs> and sound like one. Okay? So you, we are able, the brain don't tell us what to do. We tell the brain what to do. So we could really just tell ourselves that we are something. And then we can become that and believe that. Well, we got to get back to the the standard of when someone is talking about somebody's mother, that it's automatically assumed that they're somebody's wife. But that's not, you know, we're, we are so far removed yeah. from that. Yeah. yeah, we are. Uh, I'm, I think that uh, marriage is more and more uh, has evolved. It has morphed into uh not getting married. <laughs> hey, we have the only man who don't want to get married anyway. You know, we we, kinda, <laughs> we, we didn't succeed on that. You know, our man will live with us for 90 years, but they won't get married. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's something that I think we could, they used to call it common law. Mm-hmm. And because there were so many of them and people were tying up their insurance and a lot of different things with the common law, the enemy stopped that and stopped recognizing it, but they used to recognize that in court, schools, birth certificates, everything. A common law marriage is that if a man and woman spend three days together, they are married. Mm. Nature will take its course. Yeah. And so they stopped allowing us to have that, and there was no money in that. See, they wanted something where we'd have to come and pay them and where they could make a record of it and tax us twice instead of one. So there was a lot of, you know, rules of why those things changed. Um, it's rare. Uh, I, I listen, listen, this is a story. I listened to Erwin and the man say, baby, can you cook or something like that? And the woman said, I'm not your mother. Mm. Now, I just explained to y'all that food is what sustained life. Traditionally, women have been in charge of nutrition. So how is it equated that the only person that's going to ever feed a man is his mother? Right. <laughs> okay. We have a big job. We birth the nation. We decide who's going to come through and who we're going to stop. That's abortion. It's a decision that we have the power and only us to make. They don't go ask the man, do you want to have an abortion? Because she don't want to have this baby, you want to have an abortion. They don't ask him, it's all on us. We make, we are very powerful. So I don't deny that, but our power does not come from having a good job with the enemy or having diplomas from colleges and universities on the wall. That's not where our power is derived from. Our power is derived from the fact that we are the mother of the first civilization on the earth in this atmosphere. Mm, that's mm. been proven we are very important and our man is very, very important and it's sad to say and this i know this is uh, this is hard but every time we break up with them they have won mm. every time we break up every time we see the you have to remember that the entire post-slavery regime was designed to make us not have any confidence in the black man to put him down, criticize him publicly, and not ever take his side. They had to make him unworthy of our love so that they could control us, thereby controlling him. Because you need a mate, that 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 duo, that two people, you can't grow separate ears of the corn. You got to put them close together. That's right. Um, we are definitely and as long as pieces. they keep us from being close together, they are winning, they are repressing us and we keep trying to normalize our captivity saying, eh, I just can't get along with them. Now the other problem we have out here is that so many of our people have mental health issues now. This repression and slavery thing is no joke. Now, my books are The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman. 
and then the black woman's guide to understanding the black man. And then my next book is called Are You Still a Slave? It's a test book where you can determine in the privacy of your own home whether or not you still acted like a slave even without a slave master. Mm. The next book is Urban Survival. That's to teach us how to uh, prepare for and survive these upcoming days when food and water is going to get short. We are getting ready to have a different kind of famine in America, and y'all going to need more than toilet paper and water. <laughs> so I wrote that to give people certain instructions and basic recommendations so you can try to prepare for your family for that. Because when white people can't feed their children, they're not going to feed ours or us. Indeed. Okay? And then I wrote Things Your Parents Should Have Told You, which is a book that some years ago was required reading in several high schools. The children had to read my book, Things Your Parents Should Have Told You, before they graduated. It's required reading. Because this gives you a lot of basic information you can give to your young person and your teenager. I guess they're probably at about 12 or 13 the way it is today. And let them read this and uh, get a better concept about what is expected of them in a civilized society among the enemy. And then the uh, other one I have is how not to eat pork a life without the pig. Our people had stopped eating pork. A lot in the 80s and 90s, and now they're back eating it more than ever. Mm-hmm. Everything we do is a trend. We don't hold on. We don't stay with anything. And that's uh, that's very frustrating to teachers, as you say, because you want to see a certain kind of progress. And now we have, at this end, the end game has been to develop a people who are considered useless. And they have a pretty much put our man in that category. And I always remind us, now it ain't gonna be no black child and black woman unless there's a black man. Amen to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, we good, but there's certain things we are not good at. And one of them is uh, having a baby on our own. <laughs> so we need these brothers. All right? <laughs> we really do. But uh, I hope that a lot of what I have said tonight will fall on certain ears in the privacy of being with your own self, that you can give some consideration and thought to it. We don't have to keep up with the new trends and ideas and idiosyncrasies of modern society. We have the power to create our own society in our head. We can behave differently. We can dress our little girls differently. We can teach our boys differently. We don't have to go along with what is popular thought, popular idea. The only thing it requires is bravery. Ooh, ooh, say that again. You have to be brave. You have to be able to claim your idea to yourself. You don't have to defend it to anybody. But that person in the mirror, that's who you got to face. And that doesn't, the things that I recommend, they do not require you to go join anything, go pay no dues, none of that. I say the person we need to get straight is ourselves, individually. That is so attracting. That is so attracting. Like I said, we trained our men to just be attracted to something that. Uh, insinuate sex some kind of way, but we can pull them back for that. They'll go with any idea we get. We've also trained our man to want us and think we're beautiful. We can be big, fat, out of shape, anything. And we have trained them that it's okay. So they don't mind that no more. You'll never hear a man complain about it. It don't matter what size we are. They're going to do whatever we do because they want to be with us. They're going to go with it. That's a lot of power we have. Because we can give them a different idea and they'll get right with that one. But right now, we have sold them on the idea that sex is the only thing that's important. And we can have a one-night stand. Or we can be together a little while. And then we can go see your other six children. I mean, you know, we just, just got, it's just all mixed up. And you have to find a way to maneuver through that. Just try to have some sanity with your own man and your own life. And let me leave with this, Eve. You got two roles in life. You can be the woman 
or the other woman. Ooh. Pick the one you want to be and stay in your lane and play it good. A word. Oh, my. Um, yeah, yeah, I know that's frightening. <laughs> I don't want it that way, but that's the way it is. No, the, okay. that is the math. <laughs> it ain't my idea. <laughs> but listen, I need to tell you all where to get my book. Yes, ma'am. And before you do that, to the people in the audience, um, our lovely co-host Isla has shared the books in the jumbo. Um, I think that we have a P.O. box where they can send you an order, but if you have, like, an online place for them to go, we well, can Well, I have well. my, uh, uh, what's that thing called? My email address. Okay. But I'm going to give you the two locations where they are. I've had so much frustration and trouble. I had to shut down so many people because people were stealing my books. They weren't printing them. They were Xeroxing them and selling them online and giving them away. I know it just was a big, you know, mess. So we got that all pretty much cleaned up. So now I can tell you where to go. They were pretending they were me and everything. But anyway, on Amazon, it's Miss Ali. That's two words. Miss Ali hyphen. A hyphen is a dash. Mm -hmm. The real sister Ali. Miss right. Ali dash, the real sister Ali. And it's space in between them. It's like a sentence. Okay. And on eBay, you go to the real Sharazad. And it'll take you straight to my location on that. And and my locations will say, um, you're buying directly from the author. And they'll, or they'll say, um, mm, yeah, that's what they'll say. <laughs> and you'll see the man. Now, I'm getting my site built again. We're going back up. You know, they, listen, they hacked me from Algeria, South Africa, London, United Kingdom, you name it, all over the world. And uh, uh, apparently there are black people in a lot of places who want to hear something different than what's, you know, out here because they are on me. And uh, I want everyone to have an opportunity to read my books. If you go anywhere to a site and they're selling my books for 50 60 80 $90, that's not me because I don't rob our people. My books are 20 to $30. Okay? Anybody trying to sell you higher than that, that's not me, and they have stolen something from me and trying to profit off of you. Hmm. So let's just go to Amazon with the Miss Ali. That's the real Sister Ali. And eBay, just the real Sharazad. And uh, you, if you put anything in that's similar to my name, I'm the only one pretty much on that deal. Sharazad, I'm probably <laughs> not spell it, okay? okay? But listen, this has been real, Eve, I tell you. I appreciate you so much, Miss Ali. Before you go, though, did you want to give your cash app? I know there's people in the audience who'd love to just say Oh, yes. Oh, no. oh, that would be so wonderful. Yes, my cash app is the dollar sign. Sauda May. Now that's a capital S A U S A U S is in Sam A U D A M A E. Sauda May. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that that really 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 would be great. That would just be so nice. I don't get that. That would be wonderful, you know, and stuff. But as I said, uh, I've mentioned a lot of things. I crammed a lot into this because I wanted you to have it. And I know you're, you know, I, I don't usually do shows of your size. You know, I do bigger stuff. But I wanted to do you because I like your spirit, your attitude, your ideas. I choose very carefully with shows like this. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. Really, I'm I'm yeah. humbled because these conversations, I, timing, that's that's a really big thing for me. And we're in this space in this time for a reason. And if we're yeah. not doing what we're supposed to do, you'll find out very quickly. The signs are all around us. I, I believe that a thousand times over. So, And uh, that that's true. The things that I like to mention are things that you can see a change in a few days. You know, this ain't no six-month course. It's just a change of your mind. Exactly. 
Exactly. Well, I again, we, we thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, well, you are so welcome. And I didn't get to hear from her. What's her name? Isla? I, she, <laughs> Isla, you, still, you listen and I hear you. <laughs> yes, I'm here. I'm actually um, loading some more stuff in the Jumbletron. I'm putting up the Cash App and I'm going to go really quickly on Amazon and um, eBay and find those links so I can share with everybody in the Jumbletron. But yeah, hello you have and... To put them on there and they can go there right if you put a link or something that yes. work. Yes. But listen, yes. thank you all again and I hope you ladies continue to be successful and that you are happy in your life and uh, it's, re- it's really real. God is amazing. Okay? He is and also Miss Miss Ali, this is Old Goon Spirit. Thank you. I want to uh, personally thank you as well for all the work you've done. And really quickly here before you go, I just wanted to share with you at the Hidden History Museum, you do have your own placard there right above Dr. Amos Wilson. And I'll quickly share with you uh, what it says about you. It says Shahrazad Ali, born April 27, 1954 in Atlanta, Georgia, is well-respected author, lecturer, and activist who has written numerous books, including The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman and Are You Still a Slave? In the late 80s, Shahrazad Ali was the... (laughs) And and I'll just leave it at that. Go ahead. Absolutely. That was at the Hidden History Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, Shout out Tariq Nasheed. And it's because of teachers like you. So definitely we're able to because you guys have given us a template and a blueprint. So salute to you. And thank you for joining us this evening. All right. So there you have it. We had a conversation with our master teacher, Ms. Shahrazad Ali. Um, I know maybe maybe people wanted to talk to her. Uh, She had to jet, unfortunately. But Hopefully you were able to garner some wisdom from her. We can hang out for a little bit if there's anything that y'all wanted to chat about or if you wanted some more information about how you can uh, support her, her books, or her cash app. Um, Isla, how do you feel about what we talked about? Oh, my goodness. That was, um, wow, I'm still digesting. I just wrote down so many notes. Um from everything that she was talking about. I think the most, um, the thing that hit me the most is that whole quid pro quo approach to our relationships, something for something, you know, well, not until you do this, am I going to be this way? Um, and I think that that is uh, devastating in our relationships. It really is. Um, Ogun, as a man listening to this elder woman, how did you feel about, what she was telling us. Is she gaming us up the right way or is she an older that we're not supposed to be listening to? No, I think her game is, is, is right on point. Um, She discussed many feelings that black men feel today. You know, we want peace. Uh, You know, that's, that's the main thing. We want peace. She kept saying that she kept saying a lot of things that were uh, making us fight and making us go back and forth. So, she, she was being very, very honest about, you know, a lot of black women and what they got going on. And I just appreciate that. She was hitting a lot of points. Absolutely. And that's what we, you know, that's what we try to do when we're talking to people and having these conversations. Um, I hope that you guys were able to hear the sincerity Um she did not have to take her time out this evening to speak with us about anything. Cause again, she's already written the books. They're 30 plus years old. I think I was two when the first book came out. So it's not like this is new information that she's sharing, but I do think that sometimes maybe people haven't come across the information. And when we're having these conversations, it sparks other conversations and then, you know, we can grow. 
I'm, I still believe. And, you know, belief is not knowledge. So this is just how I feel. But I still believe that, you know, we're in a situation where it's too many, un, it's too many people who are comfortable with the status quo and not enough people who are uncomfortable with how things are. As such, people aren't doing anything different. So having conversations with elders like her, I think can definitely move the needle in the right direction as long as we're adamant about it. I see we have a speaker. Peace to you, Royal Me. What's going on? And welcome to the Picking Podcast. B1 family. Um, I'm a little nervous, so please bear with me. But um, it was such an honor and a privilege to hear her speak. Um, I have actually had and read, I have and have read all of her books. And what she said back then is still so true today. Um, when she spoke on, you know, the dynamic between, you know, the black man and the ba- black woman, um, I'm hearing now a lot about, you know, women trying to conceive and, you know, have a family themselves. And that's very, very damaging to me because in, instead of, you know, trying to get along with our men and be women to our men and get ourselves right, you know, we try to make an excuse or a reason to cut them out altogether. So, I mean, to everyone, I mean, her books and, you know, it, it's, it's so true. It is. And it was a privilege to hear her speak today. Thank you for your words. Um, Isla, I sent you a text on the spelling of the cash app. So if you could change that in the jumbo for us, I would appreciate it. And Royal Me, don't you just hate when you already know how something's going to go, but then people are just doing the wrong thing because it just works for them better. And is it really working for them better or are they just used to doing the wrong thing? I I think they're so used to doing, well, to be honest, I think it, it might be a little bit of a two-part question. I think instead of fixing the wrong things in themselves to be a better companion or in some, you know, a better man or a better woman, they would prefer to take an easier way out or a, a route where they don't have to fix the intrinsic deficits that they have. Um, and I think she really, really did touch on that because rather than, you know, she said, if a man says, Hey, can you make me a plate to eat? Oh, I'm not your mother. Rather than you've worked a long day, you know, a lot of, you know, black men out here, especially our FBA brothers, they work so hard and, you know, to, to come home and, and not be respected and not be, you know, and, and not have those feminine things there waiting for them. That that's a problem. It, it's a problem. It really is. And look, I know I know a lot of black women who cook and clean and do what they're supposed to do. But I think that there is this reward system, I guess, where, you know, we're only going to do these things if certain other things have been completed. And I'm not saying that we have requirements that are outlandish all the time, but I do think that some of the requirements we have might be like what she said, you have to lead by example. You want something done, you want to be a wife, then maybe you start acting like a wife and then maybe you will get wifed. Um, did you hear her talking about that part? I did. And she's absolutely correct. Um, and she also said that, you know, from, you know, different cultures, they're raised, you know, from little little girls to be feminine, to, you know, be, um, you know, a supplement to their to their to their man. And I will say that even speaking with some of the older ladies that um, I know in my community, um, even they have become corrupted. I mean, they are endorsing. Um, independence and, you know, rather than, you know, being alongside, you know, a producer, a provider, someone that, you know, can increase your life that can, can help you um, and, and doing whatever you need to do to, to make sure that you, you know, are quote unquote wifed up. I mean, it's, it's very sad because our old grandmothers that are, that are supposed to have been giving us the game now are telling us, Oh, you don't need him. You know, you don't you don't need to acquiesce to any of his, you know, requests or requirements, yet you can make demands of him. 
And if he doesn't do those demands, you can either strong arm him or you can go, you know, to the government and, and, and help work alongside them to force him to do those things. And like I said, they're just it's just not right. And I don't I, I feel like everything she said tonight was completely spot on. But the sad thing is, you know, the things that she had predicted in her book way back then are still true today. We haven't we haven't you know, move the needle forward like we should have or as much as we should have, I feel. Absolutely. I think that if there is a hatred or a discontent or even misogyny in our community, it's our fault because we've been complaining about him for so long. Like, why would he want to be around us when all we do is bitch about the person that he is? Um I think about the moms who have sons and, you know, they're telling them that their daddy ain't shit. Like what, why would you tell your son that he's 50% his dad? You know, I, it's, it's like a dream killer. You know, you don't want to be a person who squashes your children's dreams. You want to be the person who nurtures them and helps them come to fruition. But if you're doing it by yourself, it's really hard. And I'm not going to say it's, not a challenge well actually I'm going to say it is a challenge but it's a self-inflicted wound if you're doing it by yourself um, I don't think a lot of black women listen when the man says that he doesn't want to have any children and then she gets pregnant and she thinks she's going to rope him into a situation and he already told her that he didn't want to have children so then whose fault is it that he's not in the child's life feel like it's our fault because if he said he didn't want to have children but here you are having a child and he can get punished for not taking care of the child but you can drop them off at the foster home or the firefighters fire firefighters house or, or What's worse it called? <laughs> the fire station or, or worse and i think i think it's become um you know common practice now to unfortunately sh- sh- bully you know we can be bullies black women can be some of the biggest bullies as far as you know strong arming our men if they won't do it voluntarily we try to guilt them or or press them involuntarily we try to make them do something that we um want them to do but then turn around and say well you didn't do it on your own volition or well i want you to take the lead when you when he did, it just wasn't the answer that we wanted. And so, you know, in turn, you then try to punish him for it. And that's just not right. And I, like I said, I mean, she was just spot on tonight and it was just, it it was such, such a rare, a rare opportunity um, to, to hear her on tonight. I'm, I'm really glad that I, that I, you know, came through. And we appreciate your, your presence and your participation. Thank you so much. Um, Peace. Thank you for having me. My brother Shango, welcome to the Pick Me podcast. Were you privy to the conversation from earlier? He must be busy, but yeah, I, I just have to touch on everything that you guys are saying as it relates to that. You know, when when we get these women that bathe in this single motherhood thing, in this independence thing, and this I can do it all by myself, man. We don't realize what they're raising up. They're raising raising up a uh, not warriors, but they're they're still going to basically have to fight our children. Those are going to be our children's peers that they're going to have to stand next to and deal with. And so when you when you're talking about dudes that you know uh, um, have uh, you know have mental issues that want to fight women and and want to be women, a lot of that comes from them single parent households and she was just kind of breaking that down you know what i mean and man i just i just i just had to uh you know say that and i'm just glad to be here to witness it but yeah um well said uh ogo but i didn't speak when she was speaking because it's like she's like my grandmother she's i was just like a kid just bring up the grandmother but to stick to the topic here um we have to under. We also have to look at the dynamic of the the, the white supremacists that put this false um, confidence, this false ego in a lot of our women, to where they'll 
hold the kids for ransom or they'll make a false charge or something like that. And so a, a lot of black men just don't want to be dealing with that. That's not my that's not my approach of it, but that's just the whole the the whole system of how it works that they've given our women false a false sense of confidence to where you don't need your man, you don't need this, you don't need that. And some some of us past in, in the past our parents have bit the bait and now they're raising um children who are not prepared from these single mother homes or with the Gabrielle Union situation, you know, our children or y'all's children don't have any kids. Y'all children, y'all have to codify them at a young age. You know, I hate to hate to um, use this example, but those of us who are on code and really serious about building the black community, we have to be like the white, get like the white supremacists in, in, in the sense that they teach their kids survival and all this stuff, how to, the mechanism of how it works. We have to do the exact opposite for our children. We have to show them how the system of white supremacy works, what to look for in their peers, how to, we just have to codify their minds through our example in a structured family home. And that'll begin to reverse, you know what I'm saying? We'll, we'll have a um, concentrated, a concentrated um, youth group, a youth class that are on code that are handling the business and they'll be able to combat what this system is trying to and really turns into hyper gear with this, um, with this targeting of our children. I agree. Um, she definitely touched on leading by example. Uh, you know, teachers are supposed to be the example, you know, you show the student how to do it, you walk them through it and then you allow them the opportunity to do it on their own. And like she said, you know, you, you want to see some progress and there's so much confusion in our community that it's hard to see the progress if you're using their standards. And I think we're at a spot in time where we don't have to use their standards anymore. And while there aren't as many black schools as I'd like there to be, there are black schools out here. People need to do the work and find these cohorts and, and the like-minded individuals and get to work because nobody's coming to save us. And that she said that she said that, you know, we we've spoken that um, other master teachers have told us that if you want to save your, you look in the mirror and save yourself. Um, you can't be a strong link in the chain that is our force to be reckoned with. If your square is not straight because you're just making us vulnerable altogether. So, yes, I'm very filled with energy from her conversation, and I hope you guys are, too. If Isla or Ogun or even Royal Me, if you have any final thoughts. Um, yeah, but my, I guess my final thought, another thing that I kind of rested on um, when she said that blindness is a real condition Um I don't know. That just resonated with me um, because uh, I think that we often forget that we either are intentionally not seeing things um, or things are being hidden from us. And I think it's important that we kind of, you know, open our eyes to um, what's going on around us and not to be complacent or comfortable um, with these unnatural things that are happening uh, that are destroying not only our families, in our communities, but even ourselves. Um, that's things like accepting um, some of these, um, you know, unnatural things that's going on with this whole sexual confusion, you know, stuff like that. We, I don't know if we even talked about that, um, but we, you know, we kind of turn a blind eye or have the, the mindset that, um, well, you know, I don't participate in it and they can do whatever they want instead of actually speaking, you know, against those kinds of behaviors and other things. But that was just one example. I'll just close with this. I just want to say what I've learned over the years is that um, listening is, is very pivotal as it relates to knowledge. And so if you aren't sure maybe how to, how to articulate what your thoughts are or what you're trying to say, I think the best thing to do is 
pass it on to somebody that can articulate it better than me. That's, that's what I always do. So if I have messages or information that I want to give to people, I let the people that really get down speak to them. So I pass on the black media, all the YouTube channels. We, sh we share that information because they can give it to the next person the most thorough. So that's all I wanted to say on that. That's real talk. People need to know what role to play. That's definitely part of the confusion that they're pushing on us, that we can do whatever we want to do. And while, look, I really believe that you can do whatever you want to do, except for be a goat or, a, you know, you fucking pans because you pansexual. You know, there's different things that just don't make sense. But, you know, if you do what you're supposed to do in the math maths, then you will be able to do what you want to do. Um, to Isla's point about the blind, the blindness of it all. She's right. We have to get, we can't be in the land of hear no evil, see no evil, because the evil is happening all around us, whether we like it or not. So, you know, you can participate on your moral high horse, or you can get down and dirty, but either way, Ignoring it doesn't mean that you're not participating. It just means that you're a coward. And like she said earlier, you have to be brave when you're having conversations or trying to change because people aren't going to want to change. Change is very scary for people. But like we've been saying on the Pick Me podcast, we like making people uncomfortable because it makes you move. And maybe you weren't ready to move. That's okay. There's a hundred plus people in this room that can help you get more comfortable. That's finding, you know, like-minded individuals and getting to work. So again, I appreciate y'all for being here with us on the pick me podcast for round 24. Um, this will be uploaded, uploaded on the YouTube probably in a couple of days. So you can check us out at the pick me podcast on YouTube. And we are normally live on Wednesdays around 930 Eastern Standard Time. So you can join us next week or the week after. And I guess lastly, don't forget, you can definitely book a ride with my friends, Jeff and Kim on Turo. Or if you have a hankering for some butter biscuits, you can check us out at.